So now that we have an instance of Cassandra up and running on our UbuServe 1, we should be able to begin to connect to it and administer it from a client perspective, since indeed it communicates that it's listening for Thrift clients. So let's look at the legacy Cassandra client. So Cassandra client, and that's the Cassandra CLI. Now this is of course the legacy client available across versions of Cassandra shell base, of course. Legacy client administration. So this gives us a starting point before you venture into connecting to Cassandra from a higher layer such as a 4G language such as Python, etc. Although this is the legacy client and is provided as part of the toolkit, the preferred client nowadays is CQL or SQL. This is the Cassandra query language, which is, of course, SQL-like, which makes the migration from RDBMS to NoSQL or NoSQL much more seamless. So let's take a look at the client. And that, of course, is going to be located in bin relative to where have you extracted your contents and it's simply Cassandra CLI. Now by default when you connect it'll connect to a generic neutral space known as unknown or the unknown schema and it defaults to the default cluster defined by the local node so default cluster on local node all by default unless you override by indicating on the command line those options where if you have the CLI available it could be on a remote desktop you may execute it, but then you'll of course like the MySQL client have to pass in that you intend to connect to a target system so it helps if you're on the same system so two shells would do so on let's say this TTY is the Cassandra instance on this TTY so terminal 2 we've got a free shell so let's navigate into our home directory into the Cassandra hierarchy and into bin. In here you'll find a number of items. And these are executable, of course, indicated by their colors or the color green. So the two key clients, Cassandra CLI, SQL SH or SQL client. These are two items. And we've also seen instances here for BAT. That's for the window size. Remember, window side of things, that Java applications run across platforms. So you can take this, this same stack and extract it on Windows. And so long as the JRE or JDK is present, you'll be able to execute Cassandra. So let's navigate to Cassandra CLI by executing it. By default, it connects to the default cluster, web app cluster, that we have defined on the loopback on 9160. Let's quit again, let's netstat NTL, and you'll see, in fact, if we sudo netstat NTLP, we'll see the process names momentarily. So let's get that going. And Cassandra is not in there, that's correct. So for now, we'll just go with this. So it connects to the Thrift port 9160, we haven't set up Cassandra for SU, on loopback by default, and then as we've mentioned, 7,071.99 are other ports of interest. Now let's reconnect to that instance. And that brings us into the default unknown key space. This is a neutral key space, meaning it isn't a valid schema with valid databases or column families, if you will, defined. It's just an empty area. Now, like with any database, Cassandra has its management key spaces that we may not interact with as a default to keep in mind. So that is expected with any DBMS environment that there will be some amount of overhead for the management of the overall system. So don't be surprised if you see additional key spaces and or column families that are defined. They're there for the management of the environment. Some commands that are of interest. Now let's say we want to learn a little bit about the environment. We can do help and this will give us the number of commands that are of interest. For example, what is the cluster to which we're connected? So after you've passed this entire screen and it's no longer in a page, well, maybe one of the show commands can be helpful. Let's say show cluster name, for example. So this tells us because in a cluster, cluster type setting, 
you're likely to be connected to any number of nodes and for clarity this helps us to know to which or to any number of clusters if you have your data segment in that way so this helps us to know to which cluster we're connected so show cluster name what about description of the cluster well describe cluster when we tab it out at defaults but describe cluster gives us information about the cluster telling us the snitch that's in use simple snitch which is for local data centers or single data centers the partitioner which handles the segmenting of the data via the tokens to be spread across the nodes that are in the system in this case with just one node all data will be stored on the local system until others join and the schema version that's currently use which is a unique ID associated with the schema so simple information that can be useful including of course the algorithm used for routing requests simple snitch versus some other type of snitch like property file or otherwise or ECT EC2 that is and how the tokens are partitioned using the current murmur 3 as opposed to MD5 or some other type of partitioner will give us a sense as to how the cluster behaves what about key spaces? Well, of course, all our information is stored within key space hierarchy. So show key spaces, tab completion reflects just that, and it includes all of the default key spaces necessary to run the Cassandra environment, including, of course, replication strategy and so on. So as we can see here, we've got some types. So there's a key space called system, and we see test type and as we scroll through these are all column families that are being spelled out and this is actually now this is bytes type that is for the data type but the column families included within the key space system include these so hints column family which is a super column which is above all in the hierarchy of columns as they're arranged within cassandra location info and a number of other items and as you scroll through you'll see additional key spaces system off system traces so at minimum, there are three key spaces available here, system traces, system auth, as well as our system key space. And those you'll see regardless whether you use SQL, CQL that is, or Cassandra CLI. Those are your defaults. So a few commands, describe cluster, show cluster name, show key spaces, show key spaces will show default management key spaces as well as other key spaces that you define. So show cluster name, describe the cluster and of course this reveals the snitch and partitioner and version information for a particular schema why is this of importance well if you think about the way Cassandra works everything's premised on the key space so how the key space is replicated is all described in the key space information which description will provide to us so one key space may let's say replicate to n number of nodes the other may n plus one n minus etc so we're able to tweak on a per key space basis how data are spread and that's what makes this so important so show keys key space show cluster name describe cluster important what about the ability to create a key space to start storing some information well that's simply create key space followed by the name of the key space maybe our key space is maybe web app one for example so this creates a key space and basically a key space is just a container of column family families so key space is a container of column families as a DB in a traditional RDBMS is a container of tables, which are of course structured, which imposes certain limitations on data that may be included, which Cassandra doesn't impose. So let's create a simple key space. So that's simply going to be, as we've mentioned, create key space web app one. Then we should have a look at what was created what that means does that mean some sort of data change to the tree now notice we need no authentication to connect to cassandra by default it is unnecessary so each key space has a unique or a uuid if you will make it a unique object insofar as the entire cluster is concerned let's go ahead and show key spaces again and there we see web app one which defaults 
in this case to a network topology strategy. So new key spaces that are created for the default download uses network topology. Let's just bring this into the full, which means as you grow the environment, the, the whole idea is that, or the whole assumption is that you'll eventually maintain your data across data centers, which includes various racks and so on. So if you start off your key spaces using, using this network topology strategy, it'll work as a simple strategy for a single data center and allow you to grow to multiple data centers. So network topology strategy facilitates growth beyond a single DC. So that is the default. Sticking with it will help us. Simple strategies associated with default system key spaces. And that's fine because each instance of Cassandra will have its own set of system related key spaces, auth, traces, as well as the basic system. So that's fine. They'll be there regardless and there's no need to have them replicated in the same way. But insofar as user defined key spaces, it's important that a sensible strategy. Now you can define with one strategy and then later on migrate, but that takes more work. And notice it shows some options, data center one one. Every key space we create within a single data center will wear data center one one. So as far as routing is concerned, Cassandra will bind all requests to the internal data center, a single data center that is, as opposed to data center two rack one or three rack one or two rack two or three rack three, etc. So the defaults are sensible. Network topology strategy makes a lot of sense in that regard. Now what about column families, storing data, so on and so forth? Well, before you can do anything with a key space, you have to use it, just like with a database. So create a simple key space, use the key space. So IE, similar to RDBMS, you connect to the RDBMS, but then you use a particular database. So you use, let's say, web app one and if you forget the key spaces use show key spaces to enumerate the available key spaces now notice it shifts the prompt and the context and indicates that we've authenticated to it so now we're within this realm one level down in the hierarchy from the top and we have no column families defined just yet no data can be stored until we define column families so how do we create a column family well, we use the create column family, and we have to determine what should be stored in that particular column family. Now, the beautiful thing about the column family notation is that we need not indicate upfront the columns that are of interest to us. This is where NoSQL or NoSQL type engines like Cassandra are beautiful because you're not fixed, you're not restricted by a set number of columns. You can, from the get-go, simply define a column family to be this variable abstract thing that grows as needed. So it's elastic in other words. So now that we've used it, create column family. So what's of interest to store? Now we've mentioned often with big data we're storing data surrounding users. So I, the, IE for example, user related attributes. And that can be anything. Attributes are like first name, last name, date of birth, perhaps other details, RSS feeds as we've alluded to, memberships, the various groups within your site, subscriptions, and the list goes on and on. So we should perhaps center our column family around the central object that drives our application. So we create a column family, which is one of the many commands. And let's say we call it simply users. This is one column family. And we need to define some things about the column family. So let's go ahead and show you. In fact, every command has help associated. So if we do, for example, generic help, you'll see create column family. And if you did a help, say create column family, for example, you'll see the various utilization options. And this will give us a little insight into why some options are necessary. So you create a column family and then there are options that can be tied, such as metadata, or perhaps the data type that should be stored in the various columns etc. So looking through this, we see that there are various data types. UTF-8 will support virtually anything stored in it. Default tends to be bytes type, unless you change it in the config files, but it tends to be bytes type. So we have to set the default columns to use UTF-8, because that's the type of data that we'll be storing. However, for some columns, maybe you'll want to store floats or integers or big int, small int, etc. Those are all supported as well. And you'll see that through the SQL interface, CQL that is, 
it's more clearly aligned along the lines of RDBMSs in terms of the data types that are supported. So have a look at the help for create column family if you use the legacy client. Now we're not, we're not advocating use, usage of the, the legacy client, but because it's included and because there are older builds of Cassandra out there, you should be familiar with it, that this is a means with which you can define and of course have data populated to your system. So we're going to create a column family called users, but there's some settings that are of interest to us to ensure that UTF-8 is the central focal point for this particular column family. So one key option is that we want to validate our keys using UTF-8. So we'll use key validation class equals to UTF-8 type so that it isn't stored as some other type like bytes type, for example. We'll copy this because we want this for two other properties including the comparator for the comparison of data that's stored in this particular column family or table structure and a default validation class for all newly inserted data to also be UTF-8 type. So this is a simple way to define our column family by defining these three options. Now for the sake of filtering data, it's also helpful if we add an option where we index one of the columns. Now we said that every single column family or every single record in Cassandra has a key and that key allows us to fetch the attributes associated with that key. But the index isn't set by default on a particular column so it's helpful if we spell out using column metadata which is documented behind the scenes using help of course with create column family. So our column metadata will include the following and the syntax includes a bit hairy syntax of brackets and curly braces, but once you get around this, it's rather straightforward. So we want an index, let's say on the column name, username, because that'll be our unique value that's stored that makes one person or object unique from the other. And we'll set the validation class to be again UTF-8 type. And it will be an index on the keys as opposed to the row, the full row. Because you can set up a column family where you force Cassandra to cache the entire row, which effectively has it operate like memcache. So just to recap, this creates a column family that is still elastic with an index on this key column username that will constantly reference and perform and allow us to perform comparisons. And this extra syntax enables what we'll invariably use, which is the where clause. Let's say on username, for example, column in get requests. With the traditional client, that's this command line client, we normally do gets and sets. So set is analogous to insert, update, and get, of course, is select from SQL, plain old SQL, or structured query language. So let's create this column. Now you can create a column family without defining an index on any column and without defining any columns. And then when you do your sets, the columns will elastically fill in. But then you won't have indexing. You'll have to manipulate it for it to work. Let's just double check this. We seem to be missing one character meta without, so let's just double check that and update it. And that's more like it, so let's update this. And again, you'll find this documentation online, so it's, it might seem convoluted at first if you're not familiar with Java or Cassandra for that matter, but it really isn't and it's laid out in the documentation. And again, you need not create indexes initially. You can always alter the column. And in fact, you should use SQL as opposed to the command line interface traditional. So now we actually have a column family and it has one column with an index username. It has nothing else. So how do we see what's here? How do we actually enumerate what's there, for example? How about the describe command, which above shows, for example, how to enumerate a particular key space, let's say web app one, and it's various column families. Again, Web App One is like a database, and one or more column families or rows live within a particular database users. And here are the settings associated with this particular item or column family. So it's largely default types UTF-8, compaction information, compaction is a feature of Cassandra that happens manually as well as automatically, 
behind the scenes to keep things nice and complex compressed that is and an index a keys type index on users username that is so this is a description of our column family users it currently has no information of course so to put information in it we use set and that's rather straightforward so now that we've created one column family that is elastic next step insert or set data and this is of course equivalent to SQL's insert and for the sake of Cassandra as well as update they're both treated the same way so what are information or pieces that we may want to set in users well maybe we'd like to set an email address a first name a last name some other items whenever you deal with Cassandra you reference a key if you think key value pairs Berkeley DB for example memcache key and then all the values so if you want to set some data let's say on the users key space for example or the user's column family that is within the key space web app one we need to specify the key for this particular user's column family the key is username as we've mentioned this is how Cassandra finds the appropriate row if you will or data set to update so if we'd like to set something such as maybe email this is how you would do it and in between would say maybe the first email address for this particular username is going to be something along the lines of maybe Linux CBT at the host name Linux CBT Ubu Serve One Linux CBT dot internal. So this will set an email record, for example, for that particular item. Now, what does that mean that it's been written? Well, if you do a list on the column family users, it'll list all the information that it's found. The row key is the username, and the one column it's found so far is email with a value of Linux CBT. Now, never mind all this superfluous information, which includes a timestamp, value equals, parentheses, because you may be wondering, does this need to be parsed out when I use my front end web app? And the answer is no, because your front end clients, such as PHP, Python, etc., Ruby, will automatically parse this information out and, re and return simply the values that are returned. So this is merely just for cosmetic purposes within this client and for instructive purposes so we can see the details associated with it remember we mentioned that timestamp drives everything so in a cluster the item with the latest timestamp wins so that's just one record now what happens if we try to insert or reinsert the same record making a mistake let's say well it doesn't add a separate record for example so you don't end up with two records simply update so inserts double or set doubles as an update as well which of course is basically self-explanatory so sets will just double as updates when translated to SQL so they're both inserts and updates so perhaps in our set documentation we'll say SQL's insert and update it doubles as both now let's take a set that we've just executed and this sets a simple column attribute a new attribute again username is the key and let's just paste that in and that sets the value for us in there so what's in this particular database well we've got this row key username which is auto hash which is auto sorted then any columns can be referenced accordingly let's set something else what about first name last name so on and so forth so set users and the key is username but in this case we want to set let's say F name because we've set that already and it'll be auto hash for us. And let's set this equal to or username F name that is so because that's how it references the key is equal to let's say Linux CBT user one or Linux CBT without it since it's truly a first name. So now let's do a list users again which lists wholesale. So now for this particular row which is indexed by username, two columns exist, etc. Let's add yet another column. Let's say this is user two, and this will become maybe last name. And now let's list users again. So we've got one record with three columns. Now under traditional RDBMS semantics, we'd be forced to repeat this under normal circumstances for all users added to the system. Now what about other users? What if we wanted to define a separate user, a new user? So you find a new user, let's say we get this record, user email, and you define it, let's say Linux CBT2, or maybe Linux CBT at Linux CBT UbuServe2 to differentiate it. So this will now create a new record. Now let's do list users again. So 
let's see what we've got. We've got UbuServ2. Actually, we wanted to do username, email. Let's double check that. It's actually overriding because the username is the key. So if we set this to username two, so let's reset this to one and then this to two, then our index will grow by one. And let's take a look at list users again. And now we've got username, username two, so on and so forth. The index could be something else, it could be an ID, but we're just trying to make it clear that this is one user versus another user. So notice we have two records. One user has three columns, the other has one column. And this is where the flexibility starts to grow. Now let's say we define username two to include maybe a last name, but maybe we don't know the first name. So username two will be maybe user two. Let's list again. And now we've got two columns, one user, three columns for another user. So this is a sort of flexibility. It's variable length, if you will. Now, of course, you can get the information specifically using the gets. That's the converse. You just pick out the values. So for example, get me all the information pertaining to username, for example, the first person. So there are the records for that particular person. What about for username two? Well, there are the columns for that particular user. So you can get them individually using get commands as well. So username, and let's just bring this into the fold. We're indexing it using this long prefix of username, but you can differentiate it just using numerical values. So this will be perhaps this user, etc. And then gets. So get data, of course that's SQL select. So simply get one option from the user's column family username and this retrieves first record. And of course this will retrieve the second record username too because it's indexed based on this column. So second record etc. Or you could simply do a list, the entire column family, and this will return, so returns all records as an optional mean if you need a quick dump and we terminate with semicolon both in the standard command line client and the SQL SH client. So nothing magical here, we're storing data. Let's just make sure the data persists. So if we kill the instance, control C, that'll momentarily break it and then any requests obviously should die. So let's wait for this to die, it's dead. And now when we make requests, it'll fail, can't make the connection. Let's fire Cassandra back up and then momentarily that'll come up. It loads very quickly actually and it drops the client so we reconnect use web app one and then it has a command history so we can then get the user for particular items data is still there it hasn't been wiped and let's get username two etc so variable column lengths no big deal easy to follow you can delete user details certainly delete like sql delete so seven remove data just use delete and let's say whatever the key happened to be for the column family. So users, let's say key. And you can optionally, uh, this is something that's not easily done with SQL, standard SQL, optionally specify the column. That'll drop the actual column information. So removes column from specified user identified by key. So IE a one for example would be maybe the delete from users from username let's see what's superfluous in our mind username has let's say l name and let's say that's superfluous so get rid of l name that's username column l name and it will not wipe the rest of the data so removes solely l name column again as users in your environment for your web app add or subtract services, those services could be referenced by columns. So it's elastic. Now let's take a look when we do a get username. Now the user has just email and F name. And if we do a list users, for example, they both have two columns, two records. So it's elastic. Or you can do, of course, entire records. That's straightforward. That's self-explanatory as well. So maybe a delete user's key 
wipes all the columns associated with the key or the entire row. So it removes entire row, which of course is the key in the column families. So basically key and column families that are tied to this particular user. So B2, for example, simple impl implementation or invocation would be users, maybe we whack username two and redefine at some other point. So let's bring this back in and copy and paste. And this will trash this user momentarily. And now we have one record. And within milliseconds, of course, the other nodes who would subsequently belong to the cluster would be updated to reflect the fact that those items have been removed. So that's all happened for us. And you can also entirely drop a key space. So if you're done with the entire tree, all the records, you can get rid of it all together. So get SQL select, remove, SQL delete with ability to remove individual columns, which is unique to the NoSQL movement and to Cassandra and similar tools. So you can remove an entire key space using drop. That's familiar. So remove key space using drop. So for example, drop key space web app one, and that'll remove our context to the unknown context. So it removes key space web app one removing contained column families, which for us, for now, is simply users. And that'll set us on track to look at SQL SH. So now we're back in unknown. Do I help you see the various options? You can take a look at the various key spa spaces that are defined, show key spaces, for example. And it's just the system related key spaces that are there. If you try to use web app one at this point, it's gone. What if you reestablish it, for example? Of course, you'd wonder if it would, let's say, reattach the data that we recently defined. So you would redefine the key space and see whether or not it would take it. Let's go ahead and show you what happens in this case. The updates are rather rapid. So now we have the key space again. Let's reuse it. Now that we're within the key space context, you decide you want to take a look at what column families are there? Well, you can do the show on it to see what it sees and then attempt to do your sets and gets accordingly. Let's do a help. Then describe. And it's empty, so we're not able to, let's say, list users at this point. It's gone, so let's remove the key space altogether and recreate it using the SQL interface. So this drops us, we'll quit. That's a basic command line interface to Cassandra. It defaults to connecting, as we've mentioned, to the default node, Cassandra CLI does. If you run it with no options, that's where it puts you. If you run it with help, for example, let's quit. You'll see the startup options, which of course include the ability to connect to other systems. You specify the default syntax of IP slash port, and that connects you to remote systems, which we'll look at once we have those other systems up and running. Next, we're going to look at the SQL interface, which will be more familiar to those who are familiar with traditional standard or structured query language.